Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author and robot and today I would like to have a discussion about a couple different books that I sort of have discovered that either were slated to come out this year, have come out this year, or will come out this year because I've noticed a kind of trend or similarity between them and how they're being approached and by the title of this video, um, publishing is kind of a joke, but I would like your thoughts on them. But before we get started, just a couple of things. Number one, please remember to like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy what I do in, on this channel, and let me know if there's anything that you would like me to cover. Number two, if you would like to be featured on this channel, check out the links down in the description below. Number one is Lamwai, and number two is the Fresh Meat feature. So two very different ways to get your content featured here, and hopefully have more people find the vast variety of indie art, especially in indie creators that are out there that just are not getting the attention that they truly deserve for their efforts. And then number three, my newest book, Boom Boom Boom, has recently been released. You can get it at all of your favorite retailers. Some of the links are down in the description below. I hope that you'll check it out. It's a lot of fun and it has nothing to do with the current Ukraine-Russia crisis as much as it might seem. Um, yeah. With all that said, let's get into the topic. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I covered the controversy going on with Silver Shamrock Publishing on the cancellation of their book, The White Plague. Yeah, that's going to come up again. But I want to discuss a couple different ideas in accordance to these different books, how they're received, how they were controversial, and get your ideas on why they received the treatment that they did or the response that they did. Because one of the comments that came up or one of the discussion points that came up when discussing the White Plague is some people said, what is too dark for horror? I still stand by, there is nothing too dark for horror. You can write anything that you want, especially in speculative fiction. You're going to get the craziest of all things. And let me tell you, there is a book that will be listed today that is crazier than the idea behind the White Plague. And I would love to know why you might think it has gotten a pass. <laughs> I don't think anything's wrong with it other than it's, it could use an editor, um, and it's not the greatest thought out, but that's going to be a personal opinion. So let's jump into the different sort of stories. And if you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen me do a kind of a long thread about this. I'm better at describing my thoughts when they're written down, so forgive me if it's a little bit uh, jumbled here, but I'm going to try to be as concise and on mark as I can. So earlier this year, Silver Shamrock first announced this new book called The White Plague coming out later this year. The story was about a virus created to target Caucasians, and then it ended up mutating and society, as expected, um, collapses. Fortunately, in 2020, we faced something not quite as lethal as that, but we've been seeing the start of the destruction over the last year, especially, but we, and we've seen the aftershocks of said virus taking over our societies over the last two years. This says nothing for the long-term effects as for how COVID was handled, but we know that it affected children and learning. Suicides and overdoses increased. People forsook regular doctor appointments. Supply chains were shut down and so much more. Whichever way you roll on the subject, it doesn't really matter because the whole thing has been a disaster. Now, imagine the death count was much larger than it actually was. Like, literally targeting at least and taking out at least 10% of the, of the um, population and then some because it mutated and took out more people. You can't just start supply chains back up if the majority of the world population has died, especially those in leadership positions. This premise, because of the name The White Plague and the reference to targeting Caucasians created an uproar in certain parts of the writing community, specifically on Twitter, especially on Twitter. It was criticized for perpetuating the white genocide hoax that neo-Nazis believe. It was further criticized because, quote, it's not scientifically possible to genetically engineer a virus to go after one race. This is probably the worst take, in my opinion, because we've been talking about fiction, and especially speculative fiction. A lot of what happens in fiction isn't really possible in real life. So the the purpose <clears throat> and the purpose of speculative fiction is to ask what if. Not only that, something not being considered possible doesn't stop humanity from trying. It's how we've gotten a myriad of the inventions throughout human history. The idea of a race targeted virus is not even a new idea. Earlier last year, we read a book called New Tokyo that did the same thing, except it was targeting Arabs. And I think it was through pills, and I think they were going to release it in something else. It's been a while since I watched New Tokyo. Uh, but I do have a video on that book on this channel if you're interested. There is an entire 
the point the point of this is there is an entire subgenre of books that are viruses that are targeted at certain demographics. The White Plague was not a unique attempt at it. It just mentioned Caucasians and it was called the White Plague. Likely a spin on the phrase the Black Plague. Going back to the plot of the White Plague, the creators of the virus in this book even failed in their goal because the virus mutated and took out more people than they had been attempting to target. So why exactly did this book get the sort of uproar and attention and smearing to the author in which it was not deserved? Why was it automatically assumed that the ideas behind this book were one, to be some sort of racial supremacy, and two, judged before even reading the book? Also, I saw a lot of people not even contemplating or considering that the virus mutated. They just jumped onto Caucasians were targeted and society collapsed. And then they made all of their opinions there without ever having read the book. Why did it get this sort of uproarious response? And why were people making the judgment on its worthiness of existing or it being a bad idea based on, well, you can't do that for real in science. That's impossible in science. Well, what if it was not? Because Jurassic Park is impossible in science. And I don't see this same sort of uproar cancellation saying, that is a crappy book. That is a crappy story shouldn't exist because you can't take fossils and make dinosaurs exist again. Like, a lot of things are not possible in real life. It does not mean you can't make it a premise of a story. So, explain to me that specific logic. Also, that goes into the next story. This is how these things tie together, because we've got some vague, some vague but um, related premise ideas here. Manhunt is not a race focused um, virus. Actually, instead, <laughs> Manhunt is a post-apocalyptic genetics-based virus. In Manhunt, all the people with enough testosterone mutate into sex-hungry rapist murder beasts with barbed penises and a lust for flesh. If you can't, if they can't mate with you. The protagonists of this book are a couple of trans women who are desperately seeking out estrogen so they don't turn into the monsters, while also avoiding roving bands of turfs happy to kill them in order to protect themselves. The book creates villains out of both natal men and women, and it also recognizes the biology within the main characters, Fran and Beth, because they must brutally take estrogen however they can get it if they don't want to succumb to this virus that will get them for their biology. The men are reduced the men in the story are reduced to nothing short of the same comic book villain as every other recently depicted flat version of male villains in recent history. Rapists, murderers, probably pedophiles, and they would probably be racists if they could talk as well. They're basically just beasts. This book has received massive accolades and support. It has received starred reviews from places like the book, the ALA book list, and from um, Publishers Weekly, and as you can see, it's got massive support in the reviews. I mean, it's got some one stars as well, but it's got massive support, and this is going to be the highest rated of the books that we've gotten. This is also published by a sub subsidy of Macmillan. So this is trad published. There's <laughs> that's that's really all I got to say. It just focuses on the sex. And it's going to be important to recognize that specifically the two main characters are trans women. And it is recognized that they are not like the other like the biological women in the story because there is a antagonism between the two groups of you know, trans women and natal women. There is, and throughout the story, there is aggression between the two, especially with Fran and Beth being thrown out of spaces in which women do not feel safe, especially because Fran and Beth could turn at any moment if they aren't kept up on their estrogen. So it's very important to remember that, especially as we get into the next story in which the author of Manhunt left a review on as well. So we need to look at this. Now, number one, you're gonna notice, look at this, look at this rating difference. What is this exactly? So The Men is a story by Sandra Newman. And in this book, every person with an XY chromosome is suddenly gone, and it appears that those with XX chromosomes must rebuild society. Included in the XY chromosomes are trans women, non-binary, genderqueer, etc. If you've got an XY, you're gone. Now, reading through the reviews of this book, many have never read it. 
but they drag it for being transphobic by calling it the men and removing people who don't identify as men, even if they have XY chromosomes. Now, now I'm confused here because Manhunt is praised for acknowledging the position Beth and Fran are in as trans women. It recognizes specifically that they are not NATO women, they're not biological women, they are not like the biological women in the story. In fact, they are at risk on two fronts because they are not like the biological women. They're being hunted down by biological women and they risk transforming into beasts if they don't keep their hormones in check. The biological, and that doesn't, and that doesn't even account for the social differences that were there before Beth and Fran entered into this post-apocalyptic world because they had a different social interactions with the females they were around before society collapsed. The biological differences between Fran and Beth must be acknowledged in order to create the tension in the book, whether it's socially, physically, or with the virus. However, it's not considered transphobic for expressing the differences between Fran, Beth, and the biological women the novel hates. I'm wondering why. Why can Manhunt identify the differences between biological women and trans women, but the men can't? And then if you scroll down further here, you will see Gretchen, the author of Manhunt, left a review. And all of the top reviews on this book are mostly ditching it. And I have to wonder if that is some sort of concerted effort by a certain group of people to try and take this book down. Too many people will also admit in all of these comments that they will not read this book. They refuse to read this book, but they are still leaving a one-star comment. Now, going into the fourth book that I would like to mention today, it is Silk Fire by Zabe Elor. Elor? Elor? And it comes out July 5th, 2022. In this post-apocalyptic book, the author sets out to create a gender-swapped, gender-based dictatorship of sorts. Instead of the patriarchy running everything, it's the matriarchy. Women are in charge of everything, women are value of everything, and men are basically dirt and trash and can be stepped on at will. I think there's something in here, too, about the disposability of men um, in child in the child rearing phases as well, but I'm not sure because I haven't read this. Uh, reading through the reviews, a majority of these critics decry the misogyny of making women the abusers and men the victims within this story. It even decries the trans women in this book who receive power by becoming women in a matriarchy. Yet those same comments will then decry the trans man author of this book for getting power by becoming a man in our society. So they'll critique so they'll critique literally the opposite of what it is that they say does not exist or is not fair or is misogyny within the book. Now, I don't know anything about this person's views. I've heard that this person, the author of this book, has been inappropriate on um, Twitter. I've also heard that the author of Manhunt has been inappropriate on Twitter, and I've also seen the author of Manhunt trying to purposefully antagonize certain people because she comes off as a troll. Should also be noted. So the author of Silk Fire is a trans man, and the author of Manhunt is a trans woman, and the author of The Men is a biological woman. So I don't know if that plays into any of the feedback that any of these got. But it's interesting to see that a book written by a trans man is still called misogynistic for making women the aggressors on men. However, when you make trans women the aggressors on men, and you make um, women, like biological women, the aggressors on trans women, it is not considered misogynistic or misandrist. Because this is also targeting women. They're, they are going to be raped by all the men if they don't take out the men. They have to castrate the men. Something else in this book is that the um, main characters go farming the balls off of the mutated men so that they can eat them and consume the estrogen in men's balls. So there's um, a lot of that, and then there's talking about castrating young men so they don't turn into these guys. Now, the thing with Silk Fire is it also feels important to bring up how so many of the comments for Silk Fire, and also look at these, look at these views, or votes, um, the rejection that men can be victims is so much more important to bring up now at the current point in time because of the Justice for Johnny Depp hearing where it has been continuously pushed that and laughed at that men cannot be the victims of domestic violence or the victims of violence from women. And it seems like a brand new concept to some people. Some of the reviews even reek of people who believe that men cannot be victims of women.
looking out at one of the examples here in the reviews and you're free to look at them yourself, I invite you to go and check out the links in the description and do a comparison and even read the books if you're so interested. But this is just one example. This book tries to subvert gender roles, but it ends up doing so in the most ham-fisted way. In this world, men are forced into arranged marriages by women and husbands basically have to give their life force essence up to either their wives or their sons in order to make their sons pretty or strong enough to wed a woman or whatever. It's basically just gender bending the patriarchy in order to prove a point. That is, paraphrased from the author's own words from TikTok, quote, women are too good and too pure for this world. They need to be portrayed as people so that they can be held accountable for their own actions. Okay, first of all, women are held to ridiculous standards all the time. They have to be perfect in order to prove their worth. Second of all, portrayals of most women in this book are one-dimensional, and the matriarchy is treated as an irredeemably bad thing. So, by the author's logic, portraying women as people means vilifying them? Sorry, but that just sounds very misogynistic. It's clear that this author did no research on real-world matriarchies, and it's apparent that they also didn't give much thought into portraying a real matriarchy with any nuance whatsoever. To confine things to say that it's just fantasy is very irresponsible because it ignores the fact that if people read something in a book, it will influence their opinion of the real world. Now, I hate this phrase where it's like, I'm writing fiction, so now I have to consider how somebody is going to interpret my fiction and paste it onto the real world so I can only write certain things because somebody might misinterpret what I wrote and then put it a weird way. That's not my responsibility. I'm writing fiction. But number two, as you go up here and you're portraying women as just vilifying them and there's no good to them. How many times have I seen men portrayed as just evil? The, the patriarchy is just evil and irredeemable and all men are rapists and murderers. I mean, look at this. How is this not going, oh, the patriarchy is evil and also anything run by basically biological women is also evil. This book, Manhunt, demonizes literally everybody I'm being a bad situation and if you look at my channel here with a lot of the books that I've read I've criticized books that have made every male character just the worst thing that they could possibly be with no redeeming qualities looking at you threadbare where even the male partners on that that soldier troop saw their female partner get um, raped and all that they could do was stare at her exposed boobs because all men are just totally worthless and evil in these worlds. This is saying that, no, you're not allowed to do that, but that is literally what is done. Now, I'm not saying it's a good portrayal because I hate it when it's done to men, but if this book is setting out to do exactly to women what is happening to men, it's not illegitimate. So exactly why is there this outrage in making women the villain, the overall villain, to men? when we've literally got that all the time with women, with men to women. And sometimes it does feel like people can't accept that women do victimize men, and it happens quite often. So I don't really see this specifically as an, this is illegitimate. Of course, everybody is free to have their opinion, but just the, the, the dichotomy or the um, juxtaposition of all of these ideas with their different extremes that overlay in ways, but some are accepted and some are not, is very interesting to me. Uh, when it comes to all of these books, I'm not talking about the quality or the plot in any of them specifically. The only one that I've really seen is Manhunt because I'm about 50% of the way through it and I haven't gotten to read the others. But if you look at the comments and reactions to all four of them, there are so many cases where people will not read the book and then they weaponize the reviews to take shots at the idea or the author because they don't like something. In some cases, it looks like the the negative reviews or the can it, lo it looks like there are negative review campaigns against competing um, books in a similar genre. Now, don't get me wrong, critique and review your heart out with any of these books, with any of their actual content. I'm not saying you, you can't, everybody is going to have a response to certain things, and we're not going to like certain things, and that's totally fine, and to, to highlight that stuff. But I find that there is something peculiar about slamming a book for the concept that you have not even read yet. I find it interesting, too, to compare the transgressive nature of all four of these books with the four different ideas presented and how they're being received. It almost seems the nature of writing itself can be transgressive. The nature of writing itself is often transgressive, especially in something like a demographic-focused post-apocalyptic fiction, whether you're focusing on heterosexuals or homosexuals or males or females or race or any other variation in which you can target, like, 
to split people up. But I wonder the differences and levels of reaction to these books and the motivation behind their different destructions. The White Plague never had a chance to live because of the assumption of what it was about and the knee-jerk emotional reactions to it, in which many just wanted to cancel, get their voice out there, and then a lot of people uh, stepped back, deleted their posts, didn't want to have anything have their face related to the cancellation that they had been a part of. While the White Plague was claimed to be some racist manifesto that would demonize or uplift people based on race, Manhunt actually does demonize whole groups of people biologically and murders an epithet of J.K. Rowling, while the author purposefully goes on Twitter to try and start stuff with that author. Meanwhile, J.K. Rowling has also been stalked and threatened non-stop for years. So you've actually got a threat there. So you're talking about, well, when you write this thing in a book, then it manifests itself in real life. Okay, so where is the outrage at this book for creating an epithet of J.K. Rowling that then gets killed? Because we don't see any condemnation of that. In fact, I've seen more people praising the epithet of it or of her than condemnation. The men got dragged for recognizing biological reality and making its world based on that, even when Manhunt does the same thing. And in fact, recognizing the reality of trans women is necessary in order to create tension and drive within that plot. Finally, Silk Fire is demonized for making women the villains and men the victims. I can only imagine that the men didn't get dragged when you remove all of the men, just because it's fine to get rid of men. It would have been more or less fine if they hadn't removed everybody that had an XY that didn't identify as a man. But that's not what happened. Then Manhunt didn't get dragged because it's fine to demonize all men and women, especially the women that do not support the transgender women in this story. Maybe what I'm trying to say here is that this is all just transgressive and uncomfortable fiction, and it exists. Maybe all I'm trying to say in all of this is that transgressive and uncomfortable fiction exists. Weaponizing reviews to bolster your political or social opinions or take down your enemies and individual to threaten anybody is wrong. Talking about a book that you haven't read yet because you don't like the idea and you're just trying to slam it and ruin it is wrong. That's not what book reviews are for. Some books might make you mad. Some books might make you uncomfortable. A lot of books you don't even have to read, you don't have to like, you don't even have to want to have them exist. But this game of being a picky and choosy over literally the same ideas and trying to cancel people or books that fall outside of the chosen ones is bizarre and it often reads as downright villainous. This is what makes publishing look like such a joke because you're making friends and you're doing it politically, you're bolstering people politically rather than actually identifying the story and talking about the ideas. There are paragraphs freaking in Manhunt that are one sentence and it is my mind-boggling that it made it through an editor with some of these sentence structure choices, let alone there's just a lack of plot. I'm only saying that because I've actually read half of this book, okay? Critique any idea that you actually want, but legitimately critique the idea, the function, the way that the story was, or whether you enjoyed it or not. Not the idea itself for a book that you haven't read and you're assuming how it comes out. I'm not going to read this, but here's a one star for your bigotry and sending death threats to publishers because you don't like something that they've chosen to publish is a trash behavior. It's a trash idea and it does not belong in the writing or publishing community where we are supposed to be about sharing different ideas, different stories and empathizing and expressing different experiences. You don't have to be part of that book experience if you don't like what it is. There are millions of books published every year, but a group of marauding moralistic whatevers do not have the right to go and try and destroy every other idea or storytelling position that they don't think should exist. This might come off strong, but it's a stain on the creative community in general for takedowns like this to exist. Offensive art has always existed and no one needs to like it, but this smells so much like a power move, like a new kind of gatekeeping, and it's disgusting. If someone else's book doesn't deserve to exist because you don't like it, I hate to tell you this, but that also... But that standard also applies to you with your own story because I can bet you that there are many out there who hate your POV just as much as you hate somebody else's. And I would like to go back with um, a blog post here by Gretchen Felker Martin um, from her Patreon and just read this one paragraph here that says the idea that depicting an act and as the idea that depicting an act an artist is endorsing. 
The idea that by depicting an act, an artist is endorsing that act seems baked into the minds of certain left-leaning sets of younger people, particularly teenagers and early 20-somethings, that might have such a deep concern for the safety and social equality of their traumatized peers and the traumatized in their work... Er, and the traumatized in their own ranks can only be ad admirable. But more often than not, the form it takes is mass harassment and scapegoating targeting not institutions or major studios, but independent creators, many of them marginalized themselves. If the whole thing sounds with its zeal for censorship and its self-righteous hate campaigns against the disenfranchised, a little like the American Family Association with a glittery coat of paint, well, that's kind of what it is. The usual arguments about internet an anonymity and the horrible deformities it breeds in human interaction all apply here, and there is so much to be said of the younger age and unformed personalities of the people perpetuating the worst of it, but even older, more experienced art aficionados aren't immune to the fervor of purity in art. There seems to be a much deeper affection in these circles for corporate art, for the Marvel cinematic, u cinematic universes and its bland, calculated inoffensiveness, say that there is for art made by artists. Movies like Wonder Woman and Captain America Civil War are evaluated with a generosity of spirit that borders on delusion. Cults of enthusiastic acclaimed forming around actress Gal Gadot's on-screen thigh jiggle and the, the subtle homoeroticism of Thor Ragnarok. Corporate art exists to please. It exists to reaffirm the status quo and to build affection for and loyalty to corporations. So while I don't necessarily enjoy Gretchen's book, or at least I haven't, and I know that we will have other things in which we disagree on, I can at least agree on it here. We have to allow each other to have the creative freedom to do things that may be transgressive, and that doesn't mean that you can't have a response to it, but saying, hey, I didn't read this, I'll never read this, here's a one star for you, is not actually honest in any sort of way for the for the creative community and if somebody comes to you in a creative circle like a critique group of some kind and you bounce on them for writing some idea that you don't think that they should be allowed to have or express that is also not conducive to what the creative community has always been about which is exploration of ideas what ifs speculation creating something new maybe being offensive because humanity in general is offensive and nobody is just a sh plain plain out good guy. There are always going to be nuance behind everyone, and your main character may not be the greatest person, but we're following their story to see what it is that they do. Now, I'm writing a book where Jeffrey Dahmer Standen is the main character to put you through that life story, so I guess take that as the grain of salt that you will. But I will look forward to your thoughts on this video, on these ideas. If you would like to look into these books, um, at least the ones that are released because the White Plague, I don't know if anything is going to happen with it at the moment, but if you are interested in checking out these books yourself, all of the Goodreads will be linked in the down, in the description down below, and I, um, and I encourage you to do your own research on all of them, and I will look forward to your comments on this subject, on the variation of responses, on the trigger response of negativity for these things, and just the transgressive nature or... Like the transgressive nature of art and what it is and where the the community is going or has been going or has been mutating because i think what's best for the creative community as a whole is to be just more open and allow open conversation and avoid books that you really don't want anything to do with which is pretty much what i do i still also read a lot of books that i know are not my taste because i just want to get inside of the head of a person that is not like me but i don't expect other people to have the insane reading habits that I have. So um, looking forward to your comments and I hope that we can open up and be a more like empathetic and thoughtful and supportive community for writers and readers and, and finding new art and finding new perspectives just to explore the human experience because that I think is what writing is really about. Whether it's for something super fun or if it's something super dramatic, I think there's value in just honestly writing the perspective that you can see and you create it and you understand. So with all that said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Smash that like and um, see you in the next video. Have a great weekend and don't die. Hello boomers. My name is Yanana Nanana. In case you didn't know, I'm a YouTuber from Nide, a small town in eastern Ukraine. My family has never really understood what I do in the woods, but all I've ever wanted is to make a better life for us all.
Papa always comes home from the mines angry, dirty, and tired. It's a necessary evil to do your job and be in a place that you don't want to be. But I've never wanted to spend my life doing exactly what was necessary of me. Yanni, there's someone here to see you. Americans. Americans? Yeah. Good morning. My name is Tom Cruise. This is my partner, Bob Dylan, and we are big fans of your work. You're a couple of boomers. Actually, I'm a Gen Xer, but I digress. We'd like to sponsor you. A sponsor? What does that mean? We'd like to supply you with a couple of things to, uh, help your channel explode. Who is it? Jan Bagan. Good. For a moment, I thought you were one of the cats up looking for trouble again. What do you mean? They say they're looking for a terrorist. They want to declare war. What point is there to declare war? Human beings are simple creatures. You understand what drives humanity? You understand all human motivation. There's someone out there doing something bigger than your internet videos, and they won't hesitate to use you as a scapegoat. The Russians are begging for a reason to declare us hostile so they can take everything we have. Don't give them that reason, Jan. I should just go home, like Boris said, but I checked the video I posted last night and it has over 500 views. I'm going viral. I don't have a choice. I must produce another video. The jar I'm holding slips out of my sweaty palms. I can't waste any more time and go back for it. I grab my tripod saying, sorry, 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 while I keep moving. The jar explodes. I'm deafened by something so loud and powerful. It seems unreal. Jan, did you see that? Where the hell have you been? You mean the explosion? Yes. That was me. You needed to not do this today. You don't understand, Alex. I had to do it. I had to get the views. You're going to get yourself killed, Jan. No, no, no. They're looking for a terrorist. And how do you look different than a terrorist? I'm not trying to hurt people. Ignorance of war will not stop bullet from straying into your head.